Hello, my name is Ugerre and welcome to Hugo's Desk. Today I'm reviewing the BenQ SW271, a 4K monitor aimed to the professional photography market. Before I started, I wanted to be clear that BenQ supplied this monitor for review. With that said, I would never do false advertising and this will be a completely honest video review about this monitor. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a director and visual effects supervisor working in London. I've been working in the industry for 17 years, worked at the mill for almost five years as the head of the new composting department. And currently I'm a director and visual effects supervisor at Fire Without Smoke, where I direct trailers and game cinematics. I've been using calibrated monitors for a long time, so this review will be from a professional point of view. You can't state the importance of using a proper calibrated monitor on your workflow. It could mean the difference between delivering amateur or professional work. Color accuracy is very crucial for me since I work on a lot of finishing and grading of my own projects. Long are the days of 8-bit JPEG, Targus, and ProRes HQ. These days, clients want more, and you should deliver more. We now deliver EXRs, we deliver RAW files, we deliver HDR, we deliver H.265's QuickTimes. The world is changing from 8-bit to 10-bit and 12 and 16, from HD to 4K to 8K. Since I work a lot in finishing and grading, working as a director, as a photographer, a visual effects artist, and of course, a huge gamer, this monitor seemed like a perfect fit for me. But let's find out. Regarding the monitor specs, first the HDMI. The monitor comes with two HDMI connections, which is great for connecting a broadcast signal for grading, for example, but you also can play some games. It's a great improvement over the SW320, which only had one HDMI. Both connections can use the latest HDMI 2.0 spec with full support to HDCP2. This means you get HDR, but you also get 4K at 60 Hz. This supports the full 10-bit 444 color sampling, both on YCBCR, but also in RGB. So these HDMI connections are great for grading in DaVinci or even working in Nuke and After Effects for compositing. And of course, they are great to run high-quality HDR video, either from YouTube or from a 4K Blu-ray. You can also, of course, play games in HDR. The SW271 also includes a DisplayPort 1.4, supporting 10-bit desktops in 4K at a maximum refresh rate at 60 Hz. This means you can run a 30-bit desktop with billions of colors for all your professional applications like Nuke, Photoshop, or DaVinci. Includes a headphone jack, which is great to extract the sound from either HDMI or DisplayPort. Shame the headphone jack is on the back of the monitor. Would have been amazing if it was on the front or even on the side. The monitor can also serve as a USB 3 hub with two USB 3 connections and an SD card reader. Great for all your photographers out there that can plug and play their cameras and upload your photos directly. It is a shame, of course, the USB and the SD card are behind the monitor. This makes it really hard for us to reach them. Also, the omission of a CF card is a lost opportunity for me. Included is a USB-C connection that can be used either for data or desktop, but be aware that it does not power your Mac or laptop. Just like the PD and PV series for BenQ, the SW271 includes a USB dongle called Hotkey Puck allows you to use shortcuts and easy navigate menus. This is great for artists like me that deliver multiple outputs. You can easily jump from sRGB to Rec. 09 to Adobe RGB and even HDR in a press of a button. They are fully customizable. A shading hood is also included, a great step up from the PD and PV series. It's great to control glares and flares into your own screen, especially if you are on a very overlit environment. Shame the interior of the shade is not fully black, the reflections caused by the plastic connections are very distracting, but this is really a minor thing, I'm being very picky. I have never seen a monitor solve this problem, maybe BenQ will be the first one. The monitor also has an edge-to-edge -edge screen, which is great to put dual monitor setups. Regarding the quality build of the screen, using a color bar generator you can see that the pixels are sharp, with no apparent bleeding, Screen vignetting is minimum and image uniformity is very good. Blacks feel correct, they look black, and the screen does not glare or flare since it's very non-reflective. This monitor has a 4K EPS 27-inch screen with 350 nits of brightness, a native response of 1000 to 1, and a dynamic ratio of 20 million to 1. 
The 4K screen allows you to run photos at almost one to one. You can see the entire photo almost without having to zoom out, which means you're avoiding all these really awkward Moe effects or artifacts. It has a great 178 degree of field of view, which means unfortunately, it will allow for all your pesky clients to be around your shoulder looking at your work. But again, at least they are watching the same image that you are. The screen has a response time of 5 milliseconds. It's not going to break any records for gamers, but it is a 10-bit display, so quality of course is priority. 10-bit means millions of color support, allowing your work to match the actual quality of raw images from cameras. Just like it was shot, with super smooth gradient and reduced panning. It is also a full Technicolor certified monitor. It has a 99% Adobe RGB color space, a 100% Rex 09, and a 100% sRGB color space. This means it's a good monitor for photography, working in Lightroom or Photoshop, taking advantage of the Adobe RGB space. One of my favorite features at the BenQ PD series was the dual view, allowing you to split screen color spaces in the same image. This monitor does not have that feature, but it has something similar. It's called the Gamut Duo, allowing you to display two gamuts at the same time as a picture by picture, meaning side by side. This is great for those moments when you are delivering multiple outputs, like video and print, for example. Using the Gamma Duo, you can find out how, for example, this cover of Assassin's Creed looks on a Rex 09 display for broadcast, but also you can see how it looks when it's going to be printed. There's also a PIP feature, but I'm not sure how usable it is, since the monitor's menu is so slow to move this image around, it's not really feasible. I think at this stage, if you really want to see a film while you're working, you can really just use an iPad or a second screen. Of course, for me, since I work in the games industry, I was very interested on the HDR and 4K capabilities. Playing HDR games is amazing on this screen. The colors are vibrant, the exposure is amazing. It really showcases the extra realism of an HDR image. It's much closer to the human eye and how we perceive contrast. It's hard to describe since I can't show you an HDR, but I can show you at least a simulation. As seen here in Nuke, 10, 16, or even 32-bit float images are nothing new for us in the visual effects industry. So by sliding the exposure, you can see the huge latitude of an EXR, a huge latitude of an HDRI panorama, or even a frame from a red camera or a Blackmagic Urza Pro when you film in RAW. Using HDR in a film or in a game or even in visual effects productions means that the solves between images have the correct dynamic range. They fit in and out realistically, like your eyes see them. There is no flat image that looks like the whites are washed out. We call this clipping or clamping images. Also, glares and flares react naturally, as seen here on Gran Turismo. The glow of the sun seems much more bright than normal as SDR screens. As you can see here on Uncharted, just look at how the light bulb reacts. On the HDR version, you have a vivid light source that has super whites. And as we pause the menu, you can see that the light naturally exposes down. On the SDR version, on the other hand, you can see that there is a clamped image and it lacks latitude and it does not have any extra details. Watching a film in HDR or playing a game in HDR means you can see the same high quality 10 bit plus images that we've been working on the VFX or grading side for many years. Means the consumer can have a better master file much closer to the final grade and final version that we did. I especially recommend using the PS4 Pro. You need to try this monitor in Gran Turismo. It is by far the most detailed HDR setting setup that I've seen in the game. The game looks amazing in HDR. I can also recommend the Xbox One Forza 7. It is a close second for me. From a professional point of view, having HDR is a great selling point for me. Basically means that I'm future-proofing my workflow. I can use HDR from an SDI Blackmagic 4K card to grade in DaVinci or in Final Cut X. It's a shame that there is not a lot of control on the HDR, but it is a very early implementation and the industry itself is still learning how to deal with HDR currently. Keep in mind that you will only take advantage of this monitor if your video card supports more than 8-bit. You will need a graphic card that has 10-bit support, like an NVIDIA Quadro or an AMD Fire Pro. 
They both support 30-bit color space, means that you have 10 bit per channel. And it supports in Photoshop, DaVinci, Nuke, After Effects, Base Light, among other applications. Using a regular NVIDIA card will only produce 10 bit during gameplay or in specialized video content. It will not produce 10 bit on a desktop with support for pro applications. The monitor has a hardware calibration, meaning you can apply the calibration into the monitor itself in its menus. So it's not just a display profile. The shading hood even has a hole for the cable of the calibrator. In this case, I'm using the X-Rite Pro calibrator. The SW271 includes the Palette Master Element calibration software. Same software found on the PV series. Allows you to calibrate and also evaluate the screen. This means it supports a 14-bit 3D LUT with a very low delta. The software is easy to use, but it's not very in-depth. I did find the software not very well documented. And it does not give you proper results every time. I had to repeat the calibration quite a few times to get a positive validation. I'm hoping that this can be solved with an update soon. The monitor is also great for grading in 100 Rex 9 for video, as seen here in Nuke Studio or in DaVinci. So in the end for me, the pros and cons. Let's start with the cons. The reflective surface inside the wood is very distracting. Of course, I'm being very picky. The hardware calibration fails sometimes. No in-depth documentation about the palette master. No settings on HDR mode. No CF card reader. The SD card should have been really in the front and not in the back. They are very hard to reach. The USB-C does not charge the laptop. The missing dual view mode is a missed opportunity. Only two USB ports, four would have been much nicer. And this is not much of a con really, but it would have been really cool to have a webcam built into the monitor. Now for the pros, HDR support including HDR10, Rec709 and Rec2020 full support, Technicolor certification, the monitor has a much smaller size which is great, Edge to edge, which allows you to put two monitors side by side. A shading hood is a great feature. It has two HDMI 2.0s. You can really do one to one 4K in pixel density. It has a great price point. The hardware calibration software is a must. Much faster menus than the PV series. It has a handle to carry, which is a great feature to move around the monitor. Vertical and horizontal orientation can both use the shading hood, which is great. All in all, I'm very impressed by this monitor. It's not perfect, but if you are a photographer that uses Photoshop or DaVinci a lot, then this monitor is for you. It has a terrific color accuracy, and the hardware calibration alone is a unique feature for me. And let's not forget you can play HDR content with this monitor. You can work in Adobe RGB, work in 4K with a 10-bit desktop, have a hardware calibration, watch an HDR film, play the PS4 Pro or the Xbox One X on HDR. What more can you do? It just doesn't make coffee. That is it for me today. Sorry for the long video, but there was a lot to talk about. I hope you enjoyed this video. A follow-up will come shortly in the next few weeks. If you want, check out my videos at Hugo's Desk on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at Hugo's Desk or follow me personally at Hugo C. Guerra. If you'd like to see more free videos like this one, then please support my channel in Patreon. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next Hugo's Desk.